Did Kev just beat Bang & Olufsen at their own game? Did they do the impossible and create a perfect speaker in their new LS60 wireless tower? Oh yeah, we're gonna find out. The LS60 is the latest addition to Kef's growing portfolio of active loudspeakers, and it is a slender three-way tower that features a three-quarter inch aluminum dome meta tweeter that rests inside a four-inch aluminum mid-range driver that is complemented by four five and a quarter inch Unicore force canceling base woofers. Now the LS60 features two different types of internal amplifiers, a 100 watt class AB amp for the tweeter and the mid-range, and a 500 watt class D amp for the woofer. Now, these two combined with the speaker's six drivers give the LS60 a reported frequency response of 31 Hz to 24 kHz, though Kef is very quick to note that those figures are going to be based on your EQ settings, which we're going to go over in just a second. The speaker marked primary has inputs for HDMI with support for EARC, optical, coaxial, analog, as well as two Ethernet ports, one for network and the other for communication with the second speaker. You will find a subwoofer out on both speakers, meaning you can connect up to two subwoofers to the LS60 system. The LS60 also has numerous wireless connection and streaming options. There's support for Wi-Fi, Bluetooth 4.2, AirPlay 2, Chromecast, Rune, and streaming music services like Spotify, Tidal, Amazon Music, and Kobuz. And yes, it even supports high-res music files up to 24384, though some inputs, like optical, are going to be limited to 2496. Now, the LS60 also supports other high-res formats such as DSD and MQA. So in other words, if it can be streamed, chances are the LS60 will play it. In terms of design, the LS60 is not at all what I was expecting. It is deceptively small. Based on their photographs, I expected the Kef to be more blade-like in terms of its size, and yet they sit about as high as a small pair of bookshelf speakers on a stand. And they are narrow, like really narrow. I thought they looked striking in photographs, but in person, they rank among the better looking speakers we've had in our new space. Minimal, clean, and incredibly well built, not to mention inert. For this review, we connected the Kef to our 85 inch Sony TV and Apple TV 4K, Samsung's flagship 8K LED, the QN900B, and our Hi-Fi Rose RS150 streamer. Now we tested Bluetooth and AirPlay connectivity using our M1 MacBook Pro and MacBook Air laptops, as well as my iPhone. I rounded out the speaker's bottom octaves by connecting our SVS 3000 micro subwoofer using the secondary LS60's subwoofer output. Now setting up a pair of 60s is, well, unique. Not that they require a different approach to things like placement or connecting associated equipment. No, what makes the KEFs unique is that once you get them in place and everything connected, you've really only just begun. These really do need to be adjusted to fit your room, which you do inside the KEF Connect app. So what about the app? Well, it has a profound effect on the speaker's sound. First, in order for the app to communicate with the speakers, they need to be connected to your home's network. And one thing that the Kef's Quick Start Guide fails to mention is that you're going to need to rely on the Google Home app to get your speakers on your Wi-Fi network before you can even begin using the Kef Connect app. Now, once connected to our home's network, the app had zero issues controlling the speakers, but, if you're not big on apps, this is not going to be the speaker for you. Because the app is not an accessory, it's mandatory. Now, there is a small plastic remote that gives you some control over the speakers, though if I'm keeping it at 100%, apart from volume, it's junk and has no business being shipped with a speaker of this caliber. Now, out of the box and in our room, placed where 90% of all loudspeakers we have had for review sound their best, the Kef sounded, well, eh. Okay. A quick sweep from 20 to 20 revealed a response that was a little bass heavy in spots and pretty rolled off around 5k or so, hence my initial eh. But diving into the app and making a few adjustments, specifically engaging the boundary compensation slider, treble tone control, and bass adjustments worked wonders. Adding a single SVS 3000 micro to the mix and crossing it over by engaging the app's bass management took things to 11, allowing me to not only dial in the LS60s to arguable perfection, but even tune them a bit to taste. I was even able to create a profile just for Christy, separate from my own, so we could each have our own, well, unique LS60 experience. Experience. And the resulting sound, oh my god, it was epic. Setting aside the typical audiophile debate over passive versus powered speakers, the LS60 wireless speaker from KEF can be made 
perfect in almost any environment or can be tuned to fit a listener's subjective taste, making them less of a loudspeaker whose sound you have to agree with and more of a loudspeaker that asks, what do you like? And to that end, it becomes very difficult to describe the LS60 sound because it is likely going to be different for everyone. This speaker can be bass heavy just as easily as it can sound lean or treble forward. It all depends on how you choose to set it up, which is no doubt why on the speaker's spec sheet, so many of its figures are accompanied by the asterisks depending on your settings. But let's try and break it down. Out of the box, the LS60's bass was a bit bloated and overpowering, resulting in a loss of detail down low, not to mention noticeable coloration of the mid-range. But post-adjustment, the Kef's low end firmed up considerably, becoming far more nimble and detailed in the process. I found the Kef's to be very quick on the attack down low, resulting in a performance that, while not live sounding, had noticeable presence, especially when discussing instruments like, say, double bass and drum kits. Those of you who prefer a more full range or subwoofer-esque bass response will probably want to rely on a subwoofer. The Kefs play deep but not into subwoofer territory. Now crossed over with a sub, the LS60s have enough bass output and control that allows them to blend seamlessly with products like our SVS3000 Micro, resulting in a surprisingly linear full range sound that I absolutely loved. Midrange, again, pre-adjustment was warm due to the increased bass energy, and this resulted in full-bodied vocals and slightly warmer sounding acoustic instruments, though detail and some intelligibility was definitely sacrificed as a result. Now, post-adjustment, the Kef was, well, the epitome of neutral. Nuance, detail, and intelligibility are all high on the Kef's list of mid-range attributes. Once dialed in, there is little character in their tone, resulting in a sound that is, well, transparent, clear, and very immediate. Now, highs, on the other hand, are a different story. The LS60's tweeter is where I feel the battle over whether or not the Kef is a great speaker is going to be won or lost. First, the good. Highs are well composed, rife with detail, and extended without becoming fatiguing. But I would be remiss if I didn't point out that not all high frequency information is ultimately delivered in the most organic way. For example, ride or hi-hat symbols lack a certain metallic sheen or ring to them. Those of you who may be sensitive to these types of frequencies may be jumping up and down and <laughs> saying to yourself, sign me up. But for me, I want a symbol to ring, and I want it to sound metallic, and this simply just isn't always the case with the LS60. Not like they don't sound like symbols, but that metallic reverberation that starts at and follows the point of attack can, at times, sound a little bit more like puffs of air rather than metallic. But that's, that's really about it. Which brings me to soundstage and dynamics. Given the narrow front baffle of the LS60, as you might expect, Dispersion is pretty terrific. Center focus ranks among the best with near pinpoint accuracy existing throughout the soundstage, specifically between the speakers themselves. The LS60s excel at recreating scale, possessing equal levels of width and depth with respect to soundstage. There are a few speakers that manage to cast a larger stage. Focal and Sonus Faber come to my mind, though few as neatly appointed as the Kef. In terms of dynamics, the Kefs possess terrific reflex and are capable of abrupt dynamic shifts. Also, the speakers simply scale proportionately as you turn things up, though I will admit there is definitely a point where they lock in, which I found to be around 50 dB or so. Anything below that volume tends to feel well, a little soft and even disjointed with respect to the LS60's overall presentation, but from about 55 dB on up to 90 plus dB, this is just a remarkable sounding speaker. My biggest issue with the Kef actually has nothing to do with its sound quality. Like I said, once dialed in, they're incredibly hard to fault. I mean, you can make these speakers sound almost however you want. No, it's this notion that the LS60 is a wireless speaker that I have a problem with because it's only partially true. In fact, you may end up having more visible wires than you would with a traditional hi-fi setup. Each speaker requires their own power cable, and then there is the included but optional network cable that can tie the two speakers together for a better, stronger signal. If you are only planning on listening to the LS60s via Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or an AirPlay type connection, then this is the extent of the cables needed to enjoy the Kef system. 
But the second you start connecting other equipment like your TV, CD player, streamer, subwoofer, you get the idea. The cable clutter adds up fast and you end up with quite a mess trailing away from just one speaker. Now I use cable wrap to hide some of the mess, but this is definitely something to keep in mind. A few other things to note. The speakers do emit a very faint digital noise or hiss. Now I'm confident that not everyone is going to hear it. I know Christy doesn't, but it is there and it is audible from time to time. And lastly, we experience some occasional signal dropouts, both when using Wi-Fi as well as HDMI. Now, I don't remember off the top of my head how many times this happened, but the speaker did lose signal, and when it would happen, it would last for a few seconds. And with respect to HDMI and Samsung TVs, or more specifically, the Samsung 900B that we have, this may not prove to be the best pairing, as the two often had sync and or signal issues. Oh, and one more quick note, the remote is a cheap piece of crap, and I just really want to hammer that home. As far as comparisons go, my mind immediately went to Bang & Olufsen's Biolab 28. On paper, these two are very evenly matched, but financially, the KEF will set you back about half as much, making it an undisputed value by comparison. Now, I still prefer the overall look of the 28s, but I wouldn't say they run away with the style win. Now, sound-wise, if we were judging these speakers solely on their out-of-the-box sound, Hands down, I'm choosing the Biolab 28s, which sound more right straight from the factory. That said, if you're willing to put in just a little bit of time into the KEFs, the resulting sound is on par with the BNOs, maybe even a little better. I can't say for 100% certain because we no longer have the 28s, but going off of my review notes and memory, post adjustment, the KEF LS60 can totally hang. Taking over Christie's resident mind reader role, I can hear you asking already for a comparison to Kef's LS50 Wireless 2s. Both speakers, they rely on the same app, both can be largely tuned to either perfection or taste, and both have many of the same connection options. Only the LS50 Wireless 2 will set you back about half as much as the LS60. Now the LS50 Wireless 2 is a great speaker, though admittedly, I didn't fully take to them the way I'm sure many would have liked me to, given how technically great that speaker really is. That said, I am Team LS60 all the way, and stylistically, I prefer it over just about any other KEF speaker I've seen. Throw in the fact that you can achieve near full range playback, and the case for me becomes even stronger, even though you are paying for the added performance. Now, obviously, I would love to give you all the rundown on how the LS60 compares to, say, the Bucart A700 towers, but I haven't heard them, they're not sending them to me, so I have no comment. Other notable comparisons include the Q Acoustic Active 400 Towers, the Dolly Oberon 7C Wireless, and the Bowers and Wilkins Formation Duos. Now we had the Q Acoustic Active 200s for a brief moment, but they really didn't work. Like, they actually didn't work. So we sent them back. Speaking of not working, neither did the Dolly 7Cs, and after dealing with a slew of damaged products from that brand, we can't personally recommend them either, which leaves us with the Formation Duos. I love the Duos, but that said, the KEF is a better, more refined, and adjustable package. I am very impressed with what KEF has done with the LS60. While not perfect straight from the factory or the easiest to set up, once dialed in though, they are capable of achieving something rather astounding. Pair them with a subwoofer and they will leave you wanting for absolutely nothing. Now whether or not audiophiles ultimately choose a pair of LS60s over their rack of gear and passive speakers remains to be seen, but there's just no arguing with the KEF's capabilities. Not cheap, and maybe not for everyone, but still highly recommended. So that's it. That is now my take on the KEF LS60, but I wonder what Christy thought of it. Oh, I think these are really cool. Yeah. I really like them. Yeah. Like super impressed. They were great for music and movies. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, like this is the type of speaker that if we were to shut the channel down today, I'd yeah. say, hook them up and let's just get rid of everything, everything else. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, well, once you did all the cable management to, to yeah. them, they really did look like an episode of Stranger Things <laughs> uh, with all those wires yeah, with the <laughs> trailing behind them before yeah. you got the cable wrap in place. Yeah, yeah. Like that's, you know, um, <clears throat> but yeah, they're, they're, they're cool. Mm -hmm. My only concern, mm. and this is really a concern for Kef is the price. Ooh. Okay. At seven grand, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that stings a little, you know, like, mm -hmm. yes, they are cheaper than the bail, the uh, Bang & Olufsen mm -hmm. Bail Lab 28s and the 18s. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, those look and feel a little more futuristic. And I actually, 
I can actually see what it is I'm getting upcharged for. Ooh, good uh, point. Okay. Okay. And this is something that I've really, really thought long and hard about because when I look at the LS60, and I'm and I'm not saying that I don't like them because I think they're gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. I just I think that they look like a skinny version of everything else Kef sells, Ooh. and I can see the the you know the average customer looking at them and then looking at say for example the wireless twos, or even the Metas and think wait wait why. Why are I, why am I paying? Why am I being asked to pay four thousand or even you know five thousand more? Mm -hmm. You know, it's a psychological thing. Yeah, and I believe the price is going to be the biggest objection or the hurdle that Kef is going to face. Yeah, I I have a few thoughts. I I agree with everything that you've just said, but I think there's two ways to look at it. Um, number one. I have, a, I have a feeling people that are shopping for this speaker may actually see it as a more affordable, I was almost going to say budget, but more affordable way to have a Blade-like speaker in their own home. And if you compare it to the Blades, which are passive, this is less than half the price. So there's that. But I also think that Kef, Kef has a great thing going in that they are almost now as well known for their passive stuff and their active stuff equally. You know, there are people that really do love like the LSX, the wireless twos. Now we have the LS sixties and they all really, you know, have a really nice fan base. And I think that for Kef, they obviously make more passive speakers than powered ones. And so I don't know if they're like fully transitioning into this powered world to become more like a Meridian or a Bang & Olufsen and passive is going to slowly fade away. And they're, they're just slowly making that transition or they don't fully actually want to cannibalize passive sales, in which case um, price is one of probably the easiest way to adjust the adoption rate to a certain extent. As far as what goes into these speakers, like I said in the review, they're incredibly well designed, well built. I do agree with you. They're not breaking the mold per se with respect to Kef design, but I don't really have a problem with that because as far as looks go in the hi-fi space, Kef is remarkably consistent. And whether you're buying their more affordable stuff or you're going all the way up to Blade, I think they have style in mind, which is more than I can say for a lot of brands. Oh, I totally agree with you. The thing that shocked me about these, besides the fact that they are deceptively small, narrow, but based on the photographs, I thought that they were aluminum, and they are not. They are wood, and it is a matte finish, and it's a little bit of a textured matte finish, and I can't speak to the royal blue or titanium, but I can speak to the white, because it is not satin or ugh, high gloss. Um, oh, God. Yeah. The white does get dirty, and uh, if your hands are oily or fingerprints, um, they will leave those handprints. Uh, and cleaning them is not quite as easy as if they had a coating. I think that's a small trade-off because they look way, way, way more high-end in this matte finish. But if you do get the white, know that your hands better be clean or wear, I believe they came with white gloves, wear those when moving them around. I want to talk about the Bang & Olufsen a little bit. Now, I, I do agree with you. I think out of the box, the uh, 28 sounded way better yeah. than the out of the box sound of the Kef. Mm -hmm. uh, but once you make those adjustments, like you said, the differences were negligible. Mm -hmm. Connection wise, I thought that the 28s were a lot more consistent. Mm -hmm. um, these really don't like the Samsung TV for whatever reason. And that yeah. was, a, that's been a huge uh, pain in the butt. And I, I, real quick, I don't want to interrupt you, but to those of you watching, know that we can't fully determine if that's Kef's fault or Samsung's fault. Yeah. We're just alerting you to it because when these were connected to the Sony TV, we didn't have any of these problems. Well, no, we did. They uh, once or twice, or once or twice, a we couple would, of times. I want once to, or twice I, we would drop a signal, but it never it never lost sync, like yeah. sound sync. Whereas with the Samsung, it can't seem to hold sync for more than a few seconds. Yeah, and there also is a, like a like the Samsung, like when you turn everything on with the remote, like yeah, it doesn't accept. It's not sending a, a power up CEC signal to the speakers. 
It's just it's, a, it's just it's, weird. It's, it's, so it could it could very well be the TV. It could. I just if you have a Samsung TV and you're like, hey, these are for me. I want you to know your mileage may vary, and I just want to make you aware. So if you come back to us in the comments and you're like, well, it doesn't do this. I was like, yeah, I told you. Back to Bang & Olufsen. Sorry. That's really all I was going to say as far as how I felt the two compared. Okay. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about the wires, like the Stranger <laughs> Things yeah, yeah. <laughs> episode happening behind the back. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm typically not a fan of wireless speakers that have a brain or a box that you have that has to sit in in the middle somewhere. Yeah, basically it acts as a receiver. Right. Yeah. But I can actually see that being a better solution, um, especially considering the narrow profile of the kefs here, uh, because it's just going to be easier to hide that mm -hmm. than all of the cables, depending on how many things you want to connect to them. And I think yeah. that's something that's may. I don't know how they address that. It's yeah. I mean, one of the big things that this speaker has that also the LS Wireless 2s um, had is that because one speaker is a primary, one is a, um, a, a I don't, I don't a know. A dummy? How, it's not a dummy. It, it has its own amplifier. It's not pulling power. But one is definitely a primary and one is a secondary. Um, if you have, you're going from, say, your existing um, traditional hi-fi setup or passive setup, um, it's quite possible that you are going to need to buy all new cables uh, to switch out from your passive setup to something like this. I'm not saying that you're going to need to go buy a new CD player or anything like that, but you may need to buy new cables because it's possible that your CD player has only had to be routed from, say, one shelf to the shelf below it. And now it potentially has to be routed six, eight feet away because that's where the primary speaker is in relation to your CD player turntable or whatever. Now, when I say turntable, it does not have a built-in phono preamp, so don't just connect a turntable straight to this and expect... Uh, to hear much. But that's something to keep in mind is, yes, it doesn't really cut down on cable clutter, but also the cables you have now uh, may not work because they're not, sim they're simply not long enough. So just want to point that out. So there's only one other speaker I want to bring up okay. in, com terms, in terms of comparison. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like at five grand, mm -hmm. the formation duos could become the scene stealer here. Mm. Um, I would love to see Bowers and Wilkins come out with a Mark II version of those. They need one. Yeah, because those are getting a little long in the tooth at this point. But, you know, honestly, I, I think that, of course, I haven't heard the duos in a while, but yeah. they were among my some of my most favorite speakers I've ever had. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they could be the wireless speaker to get if the price stays around the same, if they could come out with a Mark II. Yeah. Um, and if they could implement some of that tech from the Panorama, you know, the Atmos mm -hmm. technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, whoa, Nelly, I think that could be a game changer. <laughs> that would be nice. It would be I nice. I mean, I couldn't, the, the panorama was, didn't sound great with anything else, but the Atmos was fantastic. It was. So, I don't, whatever processing they were doing for Atmos was really good. So, yeah. Okay. That's it. That's it. All right. Well, that is now our review of the Kef LS60 Tower loudspeaker. What did you guys think? Let us know down in the comments below. Uh, and my question of the day for you is this. I'm actually going to take a page uh, from Christy, and that is, what would it take for you to adopt a fully powered system like this? Is it performance? Is it price? Is it a combination of the, of the two? Or is the LS60 the speaker answer to your hi-fi prayers? I am curious. Let us know down in the comments. If you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up, like, and subscribe. Go ahead and ring that bell so that you're notified when new videos come out. If you use any of the links that Christy left for you down below, or you leave us a thanks, or you become a member, these are all great ways that you guys have continued to show your support for this channel and the work that we do here. And we both thank you very much for doing that. Follow me on Instagram at Recovering Audiophile. And that is it for us today. Got to get out of here. So remember, the only person who has to like the sound of your system is you. So happy listening, everybody. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you on the next video. Bye.